Are you currently church shopping, looking for that right church for you or your family? Perhaps you've been looking and been turned off by organized religion. It happens. Let me suggest you try Unity Church. We are a positive, practical, progressive approach to Christianity. Many who have found us have said, I didn't know there was a church that taught what I always believed. Let's be honest, people shop for clothes, good restaurants, and the right church that feeds them spiritually. If you're seeking a spiritual truth beyond tradition, try Unity Church. Come join us. From Unity Church of Christianity in Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Reverend Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational Christian church providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress with the Reverend Howard Caesar. There was a young man that was about 18 years old and he was uh, living at home. And uh, one day he, he told his parents, I'm leaving. Uh, I want adventure. I want travel. I want excitement. And uh, so he left the house. And his parents were trailing after him. And he said to them, you're not going to try and stop me, are you? And they said, no, we're coming with you. <laughs> Sounded pretty appealing. <laughs> Deep inside of each of us, at our core, is the seed of our true self. Deep inside all of us. Psycholo psychologists tell us that we have many selves with a small s. We have a critical self, a judgmental self, a fearful self, a this self, a that self. But at our core, deep inside of us all, is this true self with a capital S. And uh, that's the real deal. That's the real you. And uh, that is the God self of you. And this is the, the part of you that at your core is made of the nature of God. Okay, the nature of God is at the seed of the core of your being, of the true self. And it's what is referred to as the likeness, or the image and likeness of which you were and we were made. And so it's the, it's the sacred, holy you uh, that God created. And uh, it's basically really who you are. But you and I forgot in varying degrees about that and about our true self. And we fell asleep to some extent um, to that true self. And we covered over it in various ways with um, various conditionings and false ideas and false beliefs and limiting things um, because we had free will and we, we were making decisions all the way along and some of them were not accurate. And we're told that man's major problem is separation and that masters and mystics and teachers down through time have essentially told us this. And that the separation that they're talking about is a separation in consciousness from our true self, you know, which means that we have varying degrees of not being awake and aware and conscious of our true identity. And our true identity in terms of what God created us to be and what we are held to be in the mind of God, the true image and likeness that exists. And so our true identity is divine. Okay? Our true identity is beauty and love, and light, and goodness. That's truly you. And it has to be, because we were created by the divine. So you and I have to have that divine dimension to us. And so, as Paul said, we are all joint heirs with Christ. And that, as Paul said, Christ in you, your hope of glory. Uh, there is a Christ-likeness that is our true spiritual heritage. And it's something that we are not to forget. It's important. We have this still small voice that is spoken of biblically, this still small voice within, whether it's the voice of God, the voice of intuition. It is the voice of God within us that knows the truth. And when we hear the truth, we resonate with it. There is something inside of us that knows, uh, rings with truth. And so there's this still small voice of God within us that knows the truth if we will but listen. There's the wonderful um, passage uh, by uh, the poet uh, John, James Rhodes, actually. And, and I love what he says. Um, he states, again, that voice that on my listening ears 
falls like star music filtering through the spheres. Know this, O oh man, sole root of sin in thee is not to know thine own divinity. I love that, especially those last two lines. You see, in other words, man has had emphasized to him through the years that he is a sinner. And so the idea of getting it all wrong has been embedded in us, and that basically we have something wrong with us, we are a sinner, we're bad. It doesn't say that we, not to say that we don't make mistakes or err. We'll get, we'll get to that. But the poet here states that the, the, the sole root of all sin is not knowing your divinity. Yeah, we all make mistakes, and you can label yourself something, and you can lock onto that as your identity, but the sole root of all sin is to forget who you really are and where you're headed toward and what you're really here to be about. You see, it all has to do with where our focus lies, and it's very, very important, a healthy focus or an unhealthy focus. And so the reason I share this is because it's so important that you, all of us, remember who we really are and that we have some sort of an uplifting message of the truth of us because we were bombarded in so many ways uh, in, in the world. Last week, I spoke on what I called God's esteem stream. God's esteem stream. And I'm going to continue on that today. Today is part two of a, of a two-part series. And what we touched upon was the importance of healthy self-esteem, okay? God's esteem stream. And so a healthy self-esteem comes down basically to loving yourself. And I don't think we can say enough about loving ourselves. Uh, it takes a while to get through of all of the layers uh, that we have resisting that and all that we have built up that argues against that. So important is this loving ourselves, really, to the, our quality of life, to the quality of our relationships, you see, so vitally important. Even our, our various behaviors in, in all of life has to do with our self-esteem and whether we really love ourselves in terms of how we're interacting with our world and with each other uh, in this world. And so some of the most troubled people in this world are those who have simply not learned to love themselves, uh, those who are most miserable, most unhappy, most, the most wounded of all people are those who have not learned to love and accept themselves. And so even those who have seemed to, you know, have it all together, um, they have pockets of insecurities. They have pockets of where there's a low self-esteem still being healed. We all have insecurities. And so it's even, you know, healthy. It's a healthy thing to be able to know that about oneself so that there is a willingness to be aware and notice what it is that is within yet that still needs healing that we still bump up against. Much of our growth and much of our transformation is to grow in consciousness beyond these insecurities, which are the conditions that you and I have put on loving ourselves. We have all kinds of conditions that stops love at the door and uh, can't get in. What we know is that all happiness and fulfillment really comes down to love. And Jesus stressed certainly the importance of, of love, and what we highlighted last week was you know, the important commandments that he spoke of. The greatest commandment is, of course, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. And what is often forgotten is those last two words, as yourself. You know, you can't, it, it, it means you, you can only love your neighbor, you can only love your spouse, your child. You, you basically can't love anyone until you actually love yourself. It, ha it has to be filled up for something to pour out through you. And so it's very, very Im important. And uh, we say how important spiritually love is. I mean, all the masters, mystics, and teachers have talked about that. And so uh, essentially, this is crucial. It's crucial to our quality of life. It's crucial to making a difference in the world, being a vessel through which God is moving. We're not talking about ego, edging God out. That's the part that always looks outside, and, and really it's a kind of loving our, ourselves that has superiority or inferiority built into it. That's of the ego. We're not talking about that. We're talking about loving yourself because you come back to the place that you know at the core of you, you are a child of God, and the essence of you is beautiful and wonderful and good. 
mean, we may have got some things messed up. We may be making some mistakes about us. We may have some wounds to heal, but essentially at the core is this wonderful being. And so it's more about establishing an unconditional love and acceptance for yourself. You know, right here, right now, not putting it off to some other time, that you love and accept yourself no matter what. I don't care what the conditions are, you see? And I don't care what mistakes we have made. It's, not, it's being careful not to measure ourselves either uh, based on externals and, and outward indicators as to whether we're getting it right or not. Everyone can do that. And so we want our, our, our love of self to take on a, a God quality, uh, which means that it never goes away. You know, in Jeremiah, we're told God, uh, where, where God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Well, that's the kind of love that we need to begin to have for ourselves. Um, Eckhart Tolle, some of you read some of his material. He's a wonderful, enlightened being. And, and he says, love is a state of being. It's a state of being. And he says, your love is not outside. It's deep within you. It's where love is found. We can look forever outside of ourselves, but essentially it has to be found within us. Jesus, of course, was the teacher, the model of love. And do you think he had low self-esteem? Do you think Jesus had low self-esteem, insecurity issues? I guess not. Um, you know, <laughs> Jesus loved himself because he knew himself to be part of God. And he saw everyone else as part of God. You know, people use that term namaste. Um, the divinity in me greets the divinity in you. The Christ in me beholds the Christ in you. Well, Jesus looked from, looked out at life and at people from the core of his divinity. And his identity was tu tu truly locked on to the divine. He knew there was no distance between him and the divine. Therefore, that's who he was. And he stood in that so firmly. And being able to stand in that and look from that, that's all he saw in anyone else. No matter what was going on, no matter what the errors or the mistakes, he always saw to the core, this is the truth of you. This is your true self. And that's something that we are to get to as well, of course. Jesus loved himself because he was so connected to God and love, and they're synonymous, you see? And so he, he really understood and knew that, uh, that loving himself had nothing to do with um, his, his size, his weight, his wardrobe, his, uh, the mule he was riding. Uh, none of these things <laughs> had anything to do, you know. And wherever we enter into excesses in life, you know, there's likely to be a low esteem issue. Wherever we have excess, uh, extremes. Um, let's say, you know, if, if we are excessive uh, as an overachiever, or we're extremely competitive and have to win, all the time, or for a perfectionist. You know, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that to some extent that can be a sign that you're motivated by feelings of inferiority. You know, many people have inferiority feelings that cause them to seek validation uh, and gain their sense of worth and value from things or money or power or praise or whatever is external to themselves. And that's why it's so important for us to be in touch with our feelings. Our feelings are our gurus. And we should always try to tell the truth to ourselves about what it is that we're feeling, as opposed to projecting it out to the world or the person standing next to us as having caused us to feel what we're feeling. You know, a very com a competitive person you know, can sometimes have, it's a, have a self-esteem issue, um, you know, having to win, as I say, uh, in order to feel good. And so even a person who, let's say, you know, and, and being a fan, I'm a sports fan, but I notice about myself uh, on occasion where I have to be careful because I, I used to have a, have a buddy, a friend, that, that was so invested into a sports team here or there that when his team lost, he was furious. He was throwing things around. He was zero, irritable, so angry, so miserable, uh, you know, that essentially he, he, when the team lost, he got, I'm a loser. You get what I'm saying? In other words, he projected out and was so attached to the team that it provoked his issue of feeling like a loser within himself. And that's why you have people fighting outside of stadiums or inside. You know, it's really a self-esteem, fighting self-esteem issue, really. Um, it's silly, but it's true. And uh, at least that's, that's a, a part of it. It's very, very human. Um, you know, I, I, my... 
my sister was dating a guy, and actually hadn't dated him once or twice, and I came over to the house, and I was, I was in the eighth grade at the time, and the guy was, I don't know, in high school, and uh, came over and was, uh, I was out in the yard, uh, in the driveway, shooting baskets. And uh, so he came along, wanted to buddy up to me, and uh, you know, his girlfriend's kid brother. And so uh, he started shooting baskets with me, and uh, then we decided we'd play a little one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, we'd play up to, I don't know if it was 10, first one to get 10 baskets in. And so we're playing, and it got pretty intense, because uh, I'm, I'm competitive. And, uh, <laughs> and so anyway, it came down to really, really tight up there, nine to nine and everything. Finally, uh, I did beat him. Um, got there, you know, beat him by one. And uh, so I was pretty elated and satisfied my inferiority. And, uh, <laughs> we went inside, and, uh, and I was, you know, wanted to tell my sister and my mom, hey, we, we had a good round out there, but I beat him. And uh, well, that isn't how he remembered it. He told the story that he beat me. And I was kind of shocked. And I remember that about this guy. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, and it said something about his character. And uh, it didn't mean that he was a bad person. It just meant that, you know, he had some low self-esteem. Of course, that's not what I thought then as an eighth grader. <laughs> I thought, this guy's a bum. He's a liar. <laughs> and, uh, but there are some do's and don'ts uh, to a healthy self-esteem and to stepping into God's esteem stream. And uh, one of the don'ts is to basically, you know, I think this should be the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not compare. Thou shalt not compare. And we do it consciously or unconsciously, you know. And it's something that leads to lowering self-esteem because it tends to always make you feel better than or less than, um, you know, and it's, it's, comparing, it's a comparing that's done by the ego. The ego is always weighing in on that kind of a, Comparing. And so, even biblically, you know, the, the story of the prodigal son has so many teachings there, but one of them is, has to do with even what we're talking about here as a great example. You know that the prodigal son, the young, the young one, he had gone away and um, was prodigal and everything and did his thing, and then he finally rose up and came home. And when he came home, his, his father saw him and came running out to meet him and embraced him and hugged him and kissed him and was just so delighted. And um, he called for the finest robe and, and for a ring for his hand and special shoes or sandals. And, and he had the servants uh, kill the fatted calf so there could be a party, you know, and, um, and make merry. And uh, so all of that we know. But what's left out oftentimes and people don't realize is that there's more to the story. And the more to the story has to do with the other son, you know, the eldest son. And uh, so he's out in the fields, and he hears the music, and he hears the dancing. And I mean, you can read this in the passage. And uh, he, uh, he finds out that there's been a, fat, you know, a fatted calf killed, and there's dancing and merriment and all of that. And it states, and he was angry. And he was angry, and he wouldn't even attend. And his father came out to invite him in. What's the matter? Come on in. And, and he went into his tirade. All these years, I served you. I've been here working the fields. I didn't go off. You know, I kept my nose clean. I did it right. Um, you've never given me a party where I could have married with my friends. What is the deal? So he got into comparing and uh, comparing his experience to his brothers. And low self-esteem will always invalidate one's own present reality. It will invalidate you. And basically, uh, it makes everyone else wrong and everything else in your life wrong in the comparison kind of way. Because no matter what it is, it's never enough when we get into comparing. What's come to us, it's never enough. It's not good enough. And the elder son was into believing that love is something that you earn, you know, that it comes with sacrifice. And if you're into sacrificing to get love, you have a hidden motivation of an expectation that the others don't necessarily know or understand. And when that expectation continues to come up empty because you're sacrificing, there is problems down the road. So love should not be about sacrifice, OK? Love should be about loving because that's who you are, because love is for being. You know, believing that worth is based on what you do 
uh, is not healthy. It should be based on just being love. Now, if the elder son had highest self-esteem, he would have came and he would have wrapped his arms around his brother and been just as happy to see him as his father had been. Uh, so don't get into comparing and be aware when you do. Uh, and one of the do's is, again, to tell yourself the truth about what it is that you are feeling. You know, the elder son, if he had really been in touch and aware and awake of himself, he would have stopped and said, hmm, what I'm feeling is jealousy here. Whoa, uh, I must have a fear that my father loves my brother more than me. I'm going to have to work on that issue because it's mine. Okay? So remember, one of the tendencies of low self-esteem is needing validation from outside yourself to feel good when it really needs to come from within that validation. And uh, if you have to have it from outside yourself, you will never get enough. It will never be enough to satisfy you um, because you think it comes from outside. But as we heal, you know, and, and we learn to love ourselves, then we find it so much easier than to share our love and to share our kindness and to be more tolerant of others because we're more tolerant of ourselves. We're now loving ourselves even in the midst of the mistakes and the errors and the bad choices we may make. You know, we just, uh, we, we tolerate and love ourselves and go on. And so now we'll be better able to do that with the others uh, around us as well. We tend to treat everyone around us the same way that we do ourselves, whether we're aware of that or not. And so as we grow spiritually, we begin to grasp the importance of, you know, having the emphasis be on the inner, that inwardly we're all the same, that inwardly we're all children of God, and inwardly we're all loved by God. And so there is never a sense of equality. You don't feel equal to others when you are looking only from, from you know, with your eyes outward. You know, people's lives are all different, and so they have different bodies, and they have different interests, and they have uh, different appearances, and they have different lessons that they're going through, and they have different possessions and achievements and education and cultures and everything. It's all different. And so you're never going to have equality or a sense of feeling equal to others if you're always looking in, and weighing and measuring in an outer, out, outer way. There was a blind person who was once quoted, and he went blind at some point in his life, and he said, I thought when I lost my sight, I would be doomed to unhappiness. Now I've discovered that I'm happier in some ways without my sight. Most of my unhappy thoughts came in through my eyes. I saw new things and became unhappy with what I had. I saw handsome faces of other people and was dissatisfied with my own looks. So you see, stepping into God's esteem stream means learning to see with a new focus. It means basically we're having a focus where value and worth are not determined by anything external, but internally, because we are all the creators of that assessment. And we're all created by God. And uh, we all have a unique place on our path of learning. And so conditions and circumstances and behavior may or may not be acceptable. But regardless of what they are, value and worth remains for you. It doesn't go away. Whatever your conditions, whatever your circumstances, whatever the behavior, okay? And, you know, we, we feel of equal value to anyone then. And we stop criticizing ourselves. Uh, for anything, for our mistakes, for our bad choices, for our behaviors. You know, we are not our mistakes, and we are not our behavior. We can learn from our mistakes, and we can dislike our behavior without disliking ourselves and rejecting ourselves. And so when we get to telling ourselves the truth, and when we discover our hidden motivations, we'll begin to make more awake and aware choices in our life. Realize that the future is now, it's not sometime down the road, and that means, oh, I'll get around to loving myself when I achieve this or when I find that or whatever, because our mind tra plays tricks on that. Ask yourself why it is that you can't love yourself right now. What is it that jumps up? What is it that's been haunting you uh, forever? Was it something in your past? Is it something in the present? Is it something that you don't like about yourself? Is it something that you want different, and you'll never love yourself till you get there? It's a harsh, harsh sense of condemning to yourself to not allow that. For me, it's been helpful for me to actually reflect on 
on this whole idea, and because I'm finding pockets of uh, low self-esteem and reasons that I don't fully love myself, and I have things to work through, we all do, and I think it's important to be honest and, and notice that. For me, it has come down to making a decision, a decision again and again and again to love myself. I may notice something I messed up or could have done better or this or that, uh, uh, but essentially, you have to get to saying, I decide to love myself and move on. I'm gonna love myself, I'm gonna learn and move on. Okay, no matter what, I'm going to love myself, and that's what's important. God wants me to love myself, and it's the only way that I will become a more loving person. And it is the only way that I can add love to this world, is if I do this. And I need to remember, God loves me with no strings attached, unconditional, and that's the kind of love that I need to get to for myself, and then I'll have it for others, too. There's an email that was sent to me um, this week by a friend in the congregation, and uh, some of you may have received it. It's called Tequila and Salt. And uh, I'll tell you what that means at the end, but if you recognize it, then and that's what it was. It has 11 statements that is suggested that you tape up on your mirror, so you read it every day. And uh, so it's very fulfilling and, and some good uh, wisdom in this. So I'll, I'll read these. And it says, all 11 statements are 100% true. Number one, there are at least two people in this world that you would die for. What that says for me is that there are at least two people that would, that would die for me before they go to sleep. Number six, you mean the world to someone. Number seven, you are special and unique. Number eight, someone that you don't even know exists loves you. Number nine, when you make the biggest mistake ever, something good comes from it. Number 10, when you think the world has turned its back on you, take another look. And 11, always remember the compliments you received. Forget about the rude remarks. And there's a footnote that's at the end of this, um, which states, and always remember, when life hands you lemons, ask for tequila and salt and call me over. <laughs> so, remember, thou shalt not compare. Tell yourself the truth about what you're really feeling. Validation is an inside job. Stop criticizing yourself. Now is the time to love yourself. Do not put it off. Stop or not stop, but step into God's esteem stream now and go be a light in the world. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. At Unity, we believe that God's presence of love and goodness is everywhere and that life is meant to be good. You can find out more about Unity and our teachings at unityhouston.org. Are you currently church shopping, looking for that right church for you or your family? Perhaps you've been looking and been turned off by organized religion. It happens. Let me suggest you try Unity Church. We are a positive, practical, progressive approach to Christianity. Many who have found us have said, I didn't know there was a church that taught what I always believed. Let's be honest, people shop for clothes, good restaurants, and the right church that feeds them spiritually. If you're seeking a spiritual truth beyond tradition, try Unity Church. Come join us.